and just say welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen, to Manager Madness. Dun, dun, dun. We're going to just have a fun conversation today. Uh, I've got uh, my friend um, Jason uh, Schroeder here, and we're just going to have a chat about what are the struggles that team leads, uh, supervisors, managers, PMs, scrum masters, product, what, what is it that we're running into and why and what can we do about it? And we're going to walk through uh, a, a number of things. But before we get started, uh, let me just say, uh, ask um, Jason, um, how, about, how about we do this? I'll introduce you, you introduce me. I love it, I love it, let's do it. All right, uh, Jason is a former US Army officer. He's currently based in the Raleigh, greater Raleigh area. And uh, by day is a technology program manager in the financial industry. And by night and on nights and weekends, <laughs> actually helps leaders and managers aspiring leaders achieve their full potential as an executive coach. Uh, how's that? Yeah, that's perfect. All right, your turn. Um, and, and hey, everybody, it's so nice, nice to see you all. Um, some familiar faces, some, some new ones. So nice to be with you. Um, and Jesse, thanks for having me. I, this is, this is a pleasure. It's been I don't know, five or six months since we had our last project together. And, um, it's really cool to just be with you again and spend a little bit of time. So, so Jesse, uh, Jesse is a friend of mine. We we go way back. Um, I remember meeting Jesse in person at Agile and Beyond 2019, maybe. Uh, Which is in Detroit. In Detroit. Yep. Um, I'd known about him for years. I feel like we run into each other in like CEC Scrum Alliance circles. Um, and I was just, I got to meet this guy in person. And it, I just kind of zeroed in and I'm going to win and introduce myself. And um, we've kind of stayed in touch ever since, but um, Jesse has several decades of IT experience um, and a lot of government. Um, he's done a lot of um, government experience, uh, a lot of government contracts and, and done a lot of good work for federal and state government. Um, and he actually just, just fun fact, um, as um, him and his wife became a form of empty nester, they went on a little bit of around the U.S. tour for the last, I don't know, 18 months. They were in L.A. for a while. Um, they were in North Carolina for a while. We got to have dinner together. Um, and now you're you're back in the D.C. area or somewhere in Virginia, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. We're back in the D.C. area. Well, thank you for sharing that, Jason. Glad to have you back on the East Coast. We missed you. Yeah, we're, we're back in the East Coast and we're, we're going to make some hay and cause some trouble <laughs> Starting right now, uh, we're celebrating this year ten years of our firm, uh, the independent practice that that we run at Fuel Innovation, and we've been asking some of our favorite collaborators to join us on the speaker series to just to talk about the relevant topics that people are running into in the workplace, uh, whether it's trying to get good work done or trying to make an impact, and. This topic came up, and we're gonna we're gonna go through this together. I'm gonna start off first, Jason, by telling what the listeners can expect here yeah. as to what who is a manager. And uh, I've played with these personas before, and this we're talking about the messy middle today. We're talking about the people who feel the squeeze. Uh, and and so one way to, to look at this would be the org hierarchy is conceivably moving from left to right that on the team, we have teams that have lots of capable contributors, but one or two of you are the real influencers, the one who has the ear of, of the leadership because you're on the ground and you get how it goes. And you probably are the primary collaborator with the manager uh, who has direct reports and budget, but we're feeling the the the, the squeeze between the, the rest of the people trying to get work done and the executives who are expecting it to be done. And that is, uh, these are the personas that we've introduced in, in the book, uh, Untapped Agility. And, and, and so, Jason, I, I, 
Um, I wanted to kind of ask you, which of these four profiles tend to be the ones that you spend a lot of time mentoring, coaching? Yeah. And supporting? Yeah. Most, most of my clients, and just, just for some context, um, Jesse sort of mentioned my, you know, by night executive coaching, it is, it's, it's a side business for me that that's growing and doing well. Um, and I, I just, I've checked out some stats before this. I was just curious. It's like, um, I, I, I could say I officially started this in April of last year. Um, and since then I've worked with 92 clients and had like 540 coaching sessions. So a lot, right. And I, and I have, you know, dozens of conversations every month. Um, and work with leaders from all sorts of organizations. And, and so to answer your quick, cause I want to, I want to share some themes that I'm seeing, but I, I know you, I feel like you're going to ask me about it. So let me answer the question you asked first. Um, it's mostly Maria manager and actually even one level above there, like a level between Maria and Emmett um, sort of that mid senior manager. Um, and it's not worth splitting hairs around, but I'm a second or third line manager what I'm calling a, what I would call like a mid senior manager. And they are very much caught in the middle. Um, and, and some of the, the themes and the trends that I've seen just as, as Jesse and I have talked, uh, we just decided it would be worth having a conversation about with you all tonight. Yeah. And I find that I'm, I'm working with leaders across the full spectrum here and, and again, leader is not a title. Leader is a characteristic. Um, and <clears throat> leader is someone who others want to follow. Works. I'm going to say Jason works here. There. There you go. And um, and and I and I work all over. And a leader is right. Somebody that people want to follow. Whether it's following your technical excellence, following your career trajectory, and and following your vision for what an organization or a team should do, it, leader is not a title. Um, and yet, what what brought us together, Jason tripped over a study that Pew did at the beginning of the year about the people in the messy middle, feeling the pinch most of all. And this is the chart. So, what what caught your uh, what caught your attention? What was surprising to you about this this piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there's a couple things, right? And this this article was basically talking about how um, a lot of reasons why, but we're now, you know, this was end of 23, start of 2024, we're solidly three and a half years, you know, through a pandemic. The world of work has changed in many ways. For, for a lot of folks, they went back to the way things were, but for others, the world of work was, was drastically shooken up with work from home and the great resignation and a lot of things. Here we are three and a half, four years later, and the, the engagement of managers is the, it's the worst of any role in the organization. Their, manage, their, their engagement level has gotten worse. Um, and that is because they are, they're kind of stuck. They're, they're feeling squeezed between leader expectations, like employer expectations from, from senior management and employee expectations about what they want, how they want work to look like, what they need for their work-life balance, et cetera. Um, and they're caught in the middle. They're, they're that bridge between um, leadership and frontline employees, whatever, whatever echelon of manager you are. Um, and that, 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 you know, there's a, there's an old line from the military rank hath its privileges and rank hath its responsibilities, right? It's, it's sort of a privilege to, um, uh, you know, be entrusted with um, managing workload and assigning tasks and setting strategy and giving direction, but there's an enormous burden of responsibility on management um, to help, you know, care and feed and help folks get, get what they need. And we're just seeing budgets being squeezed and resource constraints and you know yeah. what we saw last year in at the end of 2023 has only continued into 2024 and um i think we're seeing companies looking at 2025 is no better hey let's let's put a container on hiring let's try to do more with less all of these like corporate buzzwords that basically mean keep rowing like you've been rowing and we see it but keep rowing harder 
Yeah, that's that's definitely the pattern we're seeing at a macroeconomic level with the tech layoffs in um, 22 and 23. Now people are understaffed and we're asked to somehow figure it out. Um, and again, this is, whether you're a scrum master, product owner, uh, supervisor, um, senior manager, uh, wherever it's at. Um, and so what this really came to home when Jason and I worked together, and Jason, you can type into the orange boxes here, the story that, that we have here. Uh, Jason and I were asked to work with a government agency uh, and we, where they were also feeling the, uh, the crunch, they, they do more with less. There was more demand than ever before. And so we just, we did a survey. We asked them, what is the level of confidence that you have in the way of delivering um, in an agile fashion, iterative and incremental delivery in the way of managing and meeting expectations of your stakeholders? in the way of you know, delivering good quality work. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, pin that down for you. That was me, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, good, you got it. Um, and, and so um, one of the questions we asked uh, here, we asked, of, we asked of four different levels of the organization and you can see here that confidence decreases the, as you go up the organizational ladder with this huge bump uh, in the middle with mid-managers. And, and so it was a, this interesting pattern that we saw, which was that um, the uh, mid-managers, and you may not consider yourself a mid-manager, that's fine, but it's, um, both were the most um agile in their confidence, their ability, like, we can do this. We can totally do this. So this is something that we have the ability to do. Um, and uh, least confident in sustainable pace. And, and so it was one of those things where they felt, and maybe we've all felt this pinch, right? We're champions for better ways of working. We're champions for more collaboration and more creativity, more empowerment. And we know we could do more, but we're just feeling the burden, the pinch, the crunch. Um, and and I, uh, so Jason, based on what uh, we were working on with this particular organization, did this match the data that you saw? Because I didn't know that you knew this going into that gig. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, and, and I think, and it probably didn't even dawn on me until we had kind of talked about it afterwards and, and had you know, our subsequent conversations that, that led to this. Um, I think, I think there's sort of a, a just, a, and it's, it's tough to see. And it, it's something I end up working with the, the folks that I coach um, a lot on is like, how can I regain confidence? How can I regain confidence in the, you know, the efficacy of my work in my role? Like, and you see up there on the chart, right? Um, I didn't even mention this, but that that top blue line on the manager squeeze chart is um, the the percent likeliness that they're looking for another job. So there's a so all that squeeze and malcontent and you know um, malaise, if you will, is actually driving managers to start looking elsewhere and considering looking for another job um, because they just don't see another way around it. So so I think the opportunity. Um, for us in the work that we do is to help folks sort of recalibrate and reframe and develop strategies if they absolutely need to go by all means but if they want to stay in the organization what's it what would it look like to craft a better future um, to build a build a stronger team to create more breathing room for yourself um, to manage up and to get after some of these like challenges that are in front of you. So you're not just running from fire to fire. Right. Oops. Okay. So let's, let's unpack this a little bit more. Yeah. Why is this happening? Why do you, the conversations that you're having, uh, what are the trends that you're seeing people talk about that's causing a lot of this pressure and this friction for 
team leads, supervisors, product owners, product managers, project managers? Yeah, I think I think we're I think organizations got excited during the pandemic, at least in tech. Um, I worked at one organization for a few years that just went on a hiring spree. And I think a lot of tech companies especially really got caught up in, it was the great resignation for employees, but it was the great expand the belt. I don't know what you call it. Loosen, loosen the belt and, and hire like crazy for a lot of tech. And what that resulted in is just some bloat. Um, I think there weren't practices and processes in place to help organizations scale. Um, a lot of big companies got excited with the booming economy and took a lot of risk, um, made some big strategic bets and invested a lot. Um, and here we are two or three years later and a lot of that, I don't know, organizational debt and just the interest on some of those investments is coming due. Um, unfortunately, that resulted in a lot of reductions in force, and it you know affected yeah. tons of people. Um, but it's all, but it's also so. But that's only one. That's one step. Then there's also this like, okay, if you're still, if you're staying, if you're still in the organization, you're feeling this squeeze. My team got cut. There were four managers, you know, reporting to this this VP, or whatever. Now there's only three of us, but we're doing the same amount of work or fifty percent more. Um, they're feeling this this more with less and then bonus like we're coming into an election year and 2025 prognosis from a lot of um analysts is that hey like buckle up it's gonna it's we're turning the corner of 25 just like we did of 24 like nervous not quite sure um and so there's a lot of reasons for consternation yeah um so we'll call it the um uh hiring anxiety uh orgs uh, they're, they're having a higher anxiety uh, in today's climate yeah with uh, the election uncertainty with the stock market situation where there's really only half a dozen stocks that are driving the entire um stock market and they're all ai and and even then they're the, the people starting to ask where's my ai billion dollars like i was, uh, I was well okay so, yeah. That's a great point. So maybe that's, I don't know, that's the, and and folks, I promise we didn't, we didn't pre-plan this. Jesse sent me this mirror like 20 minutes ago. I was like, Hey, I'm going to put this on the mirror. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so, so I think maybe the second red bubble is just like rate of change and, and AI is a big one, right? So if you say like technology changes or, um, you know, changes that we've seen in the last, last two years, you know, nine out of 10 people are going to say AI, but, and, and we know this, <laughs> we know this from working on culture transformation and org transformation um, with organizations want to adopt agile. It's like, it's kind of the justification for agile, right? Like the rate of change is only going to increase. You'll never move as, as slow as you do now <laughs> going forward. And so that's kind of the like clarion call or like, um, justification for new ways of working, iterative and incremental, because you just can't keep up with with changing technology and changing workforce demands, et cetera. I've also heard that um, Agile is old news. Um, uh, what do you have for me today? Yeah, like what, what's the next silver bullet for yeah, me? Like, okay, we did that. We did that five years ago. Um, and we're so agile. We, we, we're scrolling everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and... And, and and so, oh, oh, I know, OKRs. Let's roll out OKRs. Yeah. Uh, objectives and key yeah. results is our new strategy framework. Great, awesome. Um, okay, that was what, three years ago? Yeah. Now, uh, now what? Um, okay, let's um, let's do uh, large language models. Let's go, okay? Um, and then uh, everybody's got their own little GPT in, in the yeah. GPT. AI innovation and everywhere, then, yep. And then, so that that pace of change, I, I have seen a, a lot of data that says that um, the um, uh, Chat GPT was the fastest product ever to get mass adoption. Ooh! And only ever going to continue to be the case. Every yeah. new 
major innovation is going to uh, uh, TikTok was another one that just completely broke yeah. all the for social media. Uh, and, and, and so this is the new reality and the new reality is, um, uh, we, uh, we are pushing against cognitive limits. Yeah. So, like, like so society's like enhanced appetite and, and ability to absorb technological advances, but like, and that that's evolved rapidly, but like our brain from an evolutionary perspective has it. Like we haven't necessarily, you know, suddenly gotten gotten bigger brains or smarter or faster or better. Um, we're just used to having stuff at our fingertips and stuff changing all the time. And so we can consume it faster. One thing that I've learned in this 18 month empty nest adventure <laughs> was that I, I was the... My wife and I, we were artificially increasing the pace of change in our own lives. Ooh. And I quickly came up against my own cognitive limits. So, okay, wait, what's my new address? Uh, are we mm -hmm. supposed to call the credit card company and new, new billing address? No, don't do that. Let's just go to the old home base. Okay, but my dad's wanting to know, like, when is he supposed to call the time zone? And... And so one of the things that I discovered was that we can uh, regulate what changes where. Uh, so the things that I can control, I choose to control. Uh, if I'm going to move into a new apartment, maybe move into one that's already pre-furnished instead of spending three mm -hmm. weeks trying to find the best deal on the best furniture. Or if I'm going to uh, take a new class uh, online as part of a, a master's program, uh, maybe uh, I, I should think about doing one class at a time instead of doing two or three at a time and regulate what changes where you can. That, and hearing you say that, Jesse, I think like, I, like I'm actually someone who's pretty high control. And that's just, just like, that's the mode of operation that I have to sort of come down from and, and learned, I've learned to let go in my own sort of leader development journey. But I think that what you just said there requires you to let, let go of control, like choose what to say no to and be, and not have to control and manage everything. Cause you can't. Yeah. Um, the personal triage is. Yeah. Yeah. To some degree. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, Jason, I'm going to ask you the big three questions, because this is something we talked about as we were going through this. Uh, in your work with, good Lord, what was it? Uh, 90 plus? Yeah, something like that. Clients. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that that they're all struggling, but there's three specific questions that they ask. Yeah. What's the first one? And what do you, um, and, and, and what is so that? I already, kind of, I already kind of intimated it's like the sh should I stay or should I go like existential, you know, like, but, but the should I stay is how can I get promoted? Like if I'm going to stay here, like I want more money and I want more recognition because I'm working my butt off. Um, and actually maybe that's, maybe that's a consequence of all the change and growth, the post pandemic, like hiring, you know, bonanza, is folk, I think a lot of folks got promoted pretty quickly. I was a team lead and all of a sudden I'm a second line manager and my my org like mm. quadrupled in size very quickly. And I didn't get a lot of manager development. I was just suddenly in charge of my peers, <laughs> suddenly in charge of people I used to be, you know, a, a, a colleague, you know, a, a, a lateral peer with. So they're used to that. They're, they're used to that. Maybe they had that jump in, in 21 or 22 and they're like, okay, where's the next one? And it's like, well, maybe there's a conversation not about promotion, but about enhancing your capability in place because you probably, and this is not something I lead with, but we work into in a coaching conversation, maybe you were actually promoted to this job before you had all the skills and, and capabilities you needed. So let's Let's stay in place and let's build build from where you are. So that's one. 
Maybe it's, um, so it's not about what's the next opportunity. It's more about how do I thrive in my current role? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I think that takes reframing, just like reframing drive. Like I just, I just think we're, we're, we're naturally inclined towards more money and more responsibility and more recognition. And I want to be like my boss, but um, your boss actually wants you to just do your job really well. <laughs> they don't, they don't want you to, so, someday they want you to take over their job, but they just want you to get better at the thing that you're doing right now. Yeah. Um, okay. So then what's the second question that they tend to bring up with you? And so what these then bosses tell, you know, the folks that I work with is like, okay, and I'm getting feedback in my 360 or I'm getting feedback directly from my manager or stakeholders that I need to work on this thing. Help me with this thing that I don't understand. And it's usually like executive presence, influence across the organization or influencing, you know, sibling organizations, um, communication, kind of with the executive presence piece, um, innovation and driving strategy. Like, you know, my boss says I do a really good job at like executing tasks, but they want me to be more future oriented and like pick up something novel and new yeah. and drive it to finish. My favorite one is uh, be more strategic. Yeah, be, my boss says be more strategic and I don't know what the heck that means. Yeah. I don't know thing one about that. And and bonus, okay, so that's actually number three then. Um, I don't have time for that. Like, I want to be more strategic. I know that I need to. Like, okay, you know, I understand, like, the best way to get promoted is actually do exceptionally well at my current job. But I think I need to get out of this firefighting mode, mm. jumping from one task to another and, you know, triaging organizational changes from from above and employee problems from below or my team's unstable or I just hired a bunch of new people and I've got to train them. I'm doing all of that day to day. Where, where the heck do I have room for strategy? This was this in particular, this was the problem that we found with the organization that where you saw the chart yeah. where that was the middle managers that felt the pinch the most around sustainable pace that they felt that um, uh, I can't delegate I can't uh, say no. Um, what do I do? And 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 the reason I can't delegate is because um, ha half of the time my people aren't ready for it. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, let me just put that there. I can't delegate. Um, they're not ready, and I feel guilty. I, well, there's I, one more actually. Okay. Um. I don't think I can trust yet. Ooh, have you heard and that? I had I had the yet because it's often as I don't think I can trust them, and it's like, well, yet. And and there's there's conversations around where do you trust and can you extend the trust and the whole thing. But there's a little bit of like, I have all the expertise. I'm the only one that can do this. I don't trust anyone else to do it. And that's where like I think like ego comes in sometimes. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, oops. Um, so then uh, what about this? You know, my boss says I need to work on X. Um, what, what tends to be, uh, so, Hey boss, I'm feeling the pinch. I'm feeling the manager squeeze. Uh, we have, I feel I have the least sustainable pace. And then the boss says, yeah, you need to work on that. Yeah. Figure yeah. that out. Yeah. I, so, um, one of the things I, I strongly encourage, and I, I try to do this in, in any like coaching engagement, is get a 360 perspective. And I actually prefer to interview folks, mm -hmm. like you know, four to eight folks that not just the manager and not just the direct reports or the team members, but other stakeholders. Give me a peer manager or an executive in another department um, that you your team supports or whatever, you know, indirectly supports, whatever it is. But, but from those 360s, getting like a full stakeholder perspective on what the gaps are, because I think, you know, we we get into these like performance review conversations and we try to have, you know, at best, you're getting a quarterly like azimuth check. But 
but in reality, you're probably just getting a year end, like, here's all the stuff you did. Great job. Here's a bunch of money or, you know, whatever the, you know, here's your bonus, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, work on this one thing. It's not, it's, it's one person's perspective. It's probably not a full 360 and, um, it feels, a, it's often like a one and done thing. So with, with like a coaching engagement and just with, 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 you know, helping folks uncover their blind spots, I found it super useful to actually go interview, you know, four to eight people mm -hmm. that I work with and get some real like data and, and bring them data, non-attributional data, um, but bring them data from the 360. You know, you had several people that observed this, others thought this, you know, you're doing well here, but there's room for improvement and help them sort of generate their own developmental plan. That's not just, you know, hey, my boss said, go, go work on communication. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is related to some of the challenges that we talked about then that I'm not feeling the comp, the degree of confidence in my current role. I want to, I want to yeah. get ahead. I want to move forward. I want to achieve. We talked about um, the squeeze of feeling the higher level, higher expectations. Uh, and sometimes those expectations don't match reality. So what's worked uh, what is something that you, one or two example stories of things that that you've seen that, that have made the positive impact for people yeah. to get from playing off, uh, instead of playing defense to playing offense, instead of feeling um, out of control to start feeling under control? I'll, I'll give you like my favorite, but cliche, and you're just going to have to believe me that it works. Um, or maybe it's intuitively appealing. I'm not sure. Work-life balance. Okay. And taking space to recharge. Um, like often folks and lead, you know, leaders and managers that I work with, they're grinding so hard, burning midnight oil, you know, hopping on after they put the kids to bed you know, waking up at 4 a.m. and go to the gym and then working for three hours before meetings start. Um, and it takes its toll. It leads to burnout, but it, it it's not strategic time. It's not thinking. It's not um, creating space for them to, to recharge. Um, so I actually do a lot of work with folks on just having better work-life balance so that they can make space to recharge. And when they are at work, they're more thoughtful about how they do it, how they engage. What does that look like? Uh, uh, well, in order to do it, you have one to tell you. Concrete. Yeah. Because like, it's just, a, you're right. It is cliche. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what to do. You have to learn to delegate. Like you cannot, mm. you cannot take that, that thing on by yourself anymore and just work on it till midnight and then get up at 6am and keep nugging. Um, you've got to learn to delegate to your team. You've got to learn to set expectations and build better accountability in whether you think they're ready or not. And I think mm -hmm. that's where like the, the sort of the rub of, I'm not sure I trust my team. I'm not sure I'm confident in letting go and I want to do it myself. And you got to kind of break through that trust barrier and get over the ego hump sometimes. Um, but, it, but it requires like more accountability in the team. I'll share with everybody here. Uh, this this is called the Eisenhower Matrix, and this in particular comes from the author James Clark. Uh, clear, Clark, clear. Yeah, clear. Yeah, yeah. Clear, James Clear. He's um, famous for Atomic Habits, and here in the Eisenhower Eisenhower Matrix, um, there are things that are urgent but not important. Those are the things to delegate, the, yeah. the things that are, and by not important, it, I mean, not necessarily executive facing or not necessarily um, value create for stakeholders and customers. There's still, um, and, the, and there's still things that need to get done. Uh, these tend to be, you know, like booking flights, approving comments, um, this is a social media example and, and other things. It, it, 
so this is one framework I would recommend that people take a look at and have, to your point, have a conversation with people about what that looks like. Another technique that we recently explored um, about taking your own free space is, is I call it um, offensive calendaring, mm. um, where you book time for yourself on your calendar so that it's booked. Yeah. And oh no, I'm sorry, I have an appointment. Uh or I've I've got a meeting at that time. I, I'm not going to be able to make it um at that time. Do you have another alternative? They don't need to know that you're meeting with yourself yeah. in the bathroom, talking I have a crazy yeah. talk <laughs> in the mirror. Yep. Yeah. 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 They don't need to know. Um uh, so that's that's one that I two techniques. Um, one is to block off time in your calendar so that you have this free space. I, if I go another eight hours straight on Zoom, I'm going to jump off the roof. The, going eight hours straight on Zoom yeah. is just not healthy. I'll add another thing to the offensive calendaring. And I, I see this with, with some folks. And I think there's a there's probably a personality type here. So this is not everybody, but I get quite a few managers that allow themselves to be double and triple booked. And, and I'm in my head, like trying not to judge, but like pulling my internal hair out, like, oh my gosh, why would you do that to yourself? Um, but there's a discipline around calendar management and like saying, no, I, I can't join your thing. Thanks for forwarding this to me, but I can't join your thing. I'm going to send someone from my team or please find another time that, that works. Like my calendar's open. If this can wait a week or two or proceed without me and please ask someone to send out notes. Um, it, it, it's, it, you have to be proactive with it and you have to be more on top of the ball. Um, but, you know, in my book, if you're, if you become triple booked, you've allowed yourself to get to that position. Yeah. That, that's, that's one of the first things that we can potentially uh, delegate is uh, can, we can still have representation if we need to. Yeah. Um, but so for example, um, do I really need to go, um, to another briefing or can I just read the briefing afterwards? Right. Right. Um, what, what's something else that that's been a breakthrough for one or two of your clients? Uh, yeah. So we thought about the work-life balance piece. You know, I think, I think we, um, so I know we we're just kind of beating up AI and, I don't know if we're beating it up, but we're just acknowledging that it's here and it's, it's not going away and people are excited about it. Um, but like, there's still a lot to be harvested from leveraging technology, from automation and collaboration tools. And like, Teams just keeps getting better. Um, you know, Zoom's great. Like the Microsoft, like if you're a Microsoft Power user with, you know, Power BI and some of the other data analysis tools, like there's just some incredible collaboration tools out there. Um, if you're like a Jira, you know, ServiceNow, whatever ticketing system you have, mm -hmm. there are some really great ways to manage work and make work visible um, and collaborate asynchronously, um, not have to have meetings, but, but like leverage our tools more. Um, and I think one of the great boons of the pandemic is like we were all working remote and a lot of those collaboration tools like really took off. And I think we're still not living up to their full potential of what they can do for us. For me, uh, I have that moment of personal genius whenever I crack open chat GPT and I actually do something. Oh my gosh, it's great. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just sat through, I don't know, a random webinar with Jesse and Jason. I took random notes. What do I do with those notes? Hmm. Perhaps I throw them into ChatGPT and uh, say, um, create 10 key points from my random notes. Yep. Uh, paste them into a Google Doc. I was actually playing around with this. And then use Zapier um, to auto email me daily um, inspiration. That is, oh, that's cool. Good idea. Yeah. And so now I've got, uh, I don't think I actually finished setting that up, but the, I, that's, that's kind of the ways yeah. that we're playing around with some of these things is, um, 
how can we turn um, an adversary, ever-changing technology, into an asset? Yeah. And, yeah. And that's that's just a couple of ideas there. And I think, and like the tip there, the tip also is just, just find one thing, like find one thing mm -hmm. that's driving you nuts. My calendar, my email, my messaging tool. Um, I, I, I don't know how to use GPT, whatever it is, like pick one thing and watch some YouTube videos, like spend, spend an hour on a Friday afternoon playing around with it and like learn one tip that week that'll make you better next week at work. And I just think like folks get overwhelmed with with the technology and all the tools and all the options. And, and I try to encourage them, like, just try one thing this week with one tool. And and that I think that goes to the point of um, this is um, you are investing your time into your sanity. And so if I can yeah. block off an hour of doing like experiments in um, filling out this Eisenhower matrix. If I just yep. spent blocked off an hour and just did that, and then I shared it with a trusted colleague, or I shared it with my mm -hmm. with a life partner, and, uh, or just a friend over coffee, then that would be an investment of my time into right. getting on top of things. Uh, okay, so we we got a couple more minutes. We wanted to box this up into about an hour total, so we've got time to to hear some thoughts, questions about from some of the people here. Uh, so I'll invite anyone who's interested to uh, maybe raise their hand or unmute. What are you running into that where you're feeling the team lead squeeze, the manager madness? What have we talked about that maybe sparked some thoughts, questions, ideas for any of you? And while you're thinking about that, there's one in particular, Jason, that I'm going to ask for. Um, yeah. For one of my favorite colleagues is um, uh, we talked about the pace of change um, and we talked about meeting managers. Um, what to do when your boss is the thing that changes the most. <laughs> and And so like, yeah. In one hand, it might be that there's a rotating chair in that in that yeah. seat, or it's the same person. It's just that their head is what's rotating 360 degrees right. every right. week. Um, so if I'm supposed to laser in on what my boss's expectations are and delegate everything else, um, and I'm supposed to control what I can control in the way of cognitive load and change, what do you what do we do with that? Yeah. I, so two things come to mind and, and I'm sure, I'm sure you'll, you'll help out with some thoughts as well. But first, um, try like, just as you're the bridge connecting employer to employee and you know leadership to uh, the rest of the organization, you're also a bit of a barrier. So like, again, rank hath is responsibility. You've got to be a bit of a buffer and not pass along the madness to your team because that, Mm. And I've seen it like you're, I know you're making, you're like making um, like so, sort of mocking it, but like there's, there are people that are like that extremely reactive, extreme, like hair is on fire and they just dump on their management, their management team um, and have them chasing after this, that, and the other. So um, protect your team from it. And actually, I I had a manager that was like this, and and there was a little bit of solidarity with all of like the six directs that that she had, like us as peers. Um, so maybe maybe tip two is like find a way to absorb that as a team, not just you individually, but like as a team. Try to anticipate, try to um, get ahead of some of it, so that your your orgs downstream are not feeling the impact. Um, and then so I think leverage the, your peers um, to yeah yeah to try to like you know wrangle and maybe it's meeting structure maybe it's like someone else needs to facilitate the conversation maybe it's you know so that they're not mm -hmm. being dominating dominating dawn um, when you have your staff meeting um, maybe it's like 
making, I guess is maybe this is idea number two, like trying to make things more visible. Hey boss, <laughs> it's the three things you told us to work on last week. Bill's still doing doing A, Jack's still doing C, and, and I'm I'm doing I'm doing B. We've got D coming in now, like, but there's only three of us. Which one of us do you want to put something on hold so we can tackle D? And and it seems like really um sort of on the nose, but like it, it's how you have negotiations as a team. It's how you negotiate a priority and how you understand where, like who's doing what. And now what we're going to do is uh, now we're going to transition to a wrap up. Uh, Jason, thanks so much for this chat. Uh, it, yeah. it, it was fun to, to kind of go down these roads and explore some things. But if people wanted to talk more to you and maybe get a little bit of that coaching yeah. goodness, um, whoa, what can they expect? Yeah, so um, reach out to me anytime. I'd love to just have a, a free 30-minute chat with anyone. Um, I, I just call it a strategy session. Uh, but you can grab my calendar and, and grab some time and we can do a networking, you know, a 20 or 30-minute networking chat. I'd love to just meet anybody. Um, but we could also do like a, a real down and down and to, to business strategy session and figure out if um, anything that I've talked about today and, and Jesse and I have have collaborated on might be useful for you. So, yeah, please reach out. And thanks for thanks for that, Jesse. I appreciate that. And I myself am going to be speaking in person at a couple of events coming up on September 20th at the PMI Global Congress called Global Summit. I'm sorry, on on prioritization. And then the New York City Scrum User Group at One World Trade Center, we're going to be talking about the book on tapped agility. So these are a couple of in-person events. If you're on the East Coast, come join us there. If you're on the West Coast, come join us there. But that's what we were wanting to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, is the reality of the squeeze and some ideas to get out from underneath of it. So thank you all for joining in and uh, appreciate what you uh, had to offer. So uh, with that, go forth and lead. Thanks, Jesse. This was a blast. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Stay tuned for more goodness. Until then, take it easy. Bye, everyone.